Good morning. I want to welcome you all this morning. I want to welcome those who are joining us by YouTube by video. We're so glad you're tuning in. Be sure to hit the like button and hit the share button and send that video on to a number of your family and friends and relatives in the community. We're so glad to have you here on this Labor Day weekend. This is the first Sunday of month, so once again we're going to be sharing Holy Communion. If you fail to do so, I would encourage you to step out in just a minute. There's a table that has some little sealed communion elements so everybody can participate. If you're joining us from home, please just uh, gather some juice, some grape juice and a cracker or some bread. And when we come to the appropriate time in the service, we invite you to, to join with us from your home uh, with your family and sharing Holy Communion together. Tomorrow is Labor Day. Our offices uh, will be closed, but we will then be opened again on Tuesday. This has been a season of illness, affliction, of injury, of surgery, and unfortunately of death. Uh, I officiated two uh, funeral services last week. We had others related to our church family uh, that I did not officiate, but still were members of our faith community. This upcoming week on Saturday, there will be a service uh, for Mr. Thomason, who is the brother of Linda Holman. That will be in Old Mulgi. That will be another graveside service uh, in Old Mulgi on Saturday at 10 o'clock. And then I'm sad to share with you the news this morning that John Arbins passed away yesterday. Uh, we do not have the uh, memorial service scheduled yet. I'll be visiting with the family uh, this afternoon. We will send out a church-wide email uh, to let everybody know uh, when the memorial for John will be. Uh, at this time, come on up, Ann. Uh, Esther Group is meeting Thursday down in the Fellowship Hall at 930. No food, but we will have a, a program and uh, be discussing the rummage sale and some other things that we need to talk about. Then the rummage sale uh, you can bring things Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday from 9 to noon. Downstairs will be open so you can bring things. <clears throat> uh, the tables will be set up and ready to go. And then the rummage cell itself is from 8 to 4 on the 18th, which is a Friday, and 8 to noon on the 19th. And we appreciate all your donations because that's how we can do the things that we do for the church. Amen. Methodist groups meeting without food. You know this thing has really gotten serious when we've got Methodist groups meeting without food. But that's, that's just the, this, the way it is right now to keep everybody safe. Sherry? Okay. So this Saturday night is going to be our movie night out in the parking lot. Um, we will be providing popcorn and candy. Bring your drinks, bring your blankets, bring your cozy gear. Um, for a movie night out under the stars. Our movie is The Incredibles, one masked family to another. So I'm really excited and I hope to see you guys. This is for everybody, not just our youth and kids families. We'd, I'd love to see some of you guys come out and hang out with us on Saturday night. Thank you. And it's free, isn't it? I don't have to sneak Christy in in the trunk or anything to get her in to watch that. Just everybody come and park and be comfortable where you can see in here. Morning, y'all. So we're very excited to announce that uh, Wednesday nights are starting back up again. Um, so not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday, which will be the 16th of September, uh, we'll be starting back up. Um, if I can get some like prepackaged uh, dinner meals um, that are kind of uh, COVID safe, um, I would love to uh, be serving dinner around 5:30. Uh, if not, then we can start, just start trickling in at 5:30. We'll start around six and, and around seven. Um, uh, also, if you, uh, for all the students, if you guys want to get involved in leadership or worship, that's the that's the time to um, uh, kind of step in and, uh, and talk to me about that. Kind of start getting involved with that. So we'll start uh, getting set up for that stuff. Um, uh, also, in here in a couple weeks on the 27th, uh, which is two Sundays from now, uh, we'll have our fall kickoff over at the Grams. It's about nine minutes away. It's really close. Um, right after church, we'll, uh, we'll be having lunch, a little pool party if it's pretty nice weather, and we'll just be hanging out for a couple hours. But yeah. And ready. that'll all be in the Grams' backyard, is that right? Yes. That, yes. That'll be the pool yeah, area. All outside. Okay. Yep. Okay. Very good. Uh, Jim Gregory is taking a Sunday off. Vicki Smith, delighted to have you with us playing the organ again. Thank you so much. Really appreciate her coming. 
So at this time, I would just invite everybody to uh, close, uh, to quiet your hearts and minds and turn your attention to God as we enter into the spirit of worship. Let the wise listen and add to their learning. Let the, discern and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It is fools who despise wisdom and instruction. Can you join me in prayer? God of all creation, you reach out to call people of all nations to your kingdom. As you gather disciples from near and far, Count us also among those who boldly confess your Son, Jesus Christ, as Lord. Amen. This song I wrote is based on Philippians 2, 10, 11 that says, Jesus Christ is Lord.
Beautiful. Thank you, Anne. I want to invite the congregation once again to please stand and uh, remain in your place. Don't, uh, don't move around or shake anybody's hand, but let's give everybody a wave, a greeting, a welcome. Show everybody that you're glad that they're here this morning, and we are glad that you all are here this morning. May God's peace be with you. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, open now our hearts uh, to the reading of your word, uh, that we may hear with joy what you say to us today through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please remain standing as Cabe comes to read a passage from Proverbs chapter 1. This is Proverbs 1, 1 through 7. It's the read out of the New King James Version. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated.
Barry, glad to have you back with the praise team. And Susan, good to see you back with us. We are so delighted for the whole team and what they bring to us every Sunday. This uh, summer, as we went into the summer months, and I was trying to pray about uh, what messages to bring, and there was just so much upset, so much confusion, so much turmoil over this COVID situation. I focused on the book of Psalms because um, it just seemed to me a lot of people needed comfort, and we needed to hear a comforting word from God. As we move into the fall, I'm going to continue on this theme a little bit, but I'm going to shift to the book of Proverbs because it seems to me that in addition to comfort, the other thing we really need is wisdom. So many different situations, how to conduct our lives, how to change our lives, how to go forward with our lives. We need some wisdom. Has there been a time in your life just felt like a big fool? Feel kind of foolish. <laughs> I've had many of those times. Usually they're misunderstandings or, or just I'm not completely grasping something or I don't understand. I remember years ago when I was looking at seminaries and a friend of mine and I went down to Dallas Theological Seminary. We were walking across the campus and we saw a sign out in the lawn. It was written in Greek and I'd been studying Greek in college and I thought we can figure this out. And we walked out into the lawn to get a closer look at it, try to figure it out, and I finally couldn't figure it out. A couple of students walking by said, hey, what does this sign say in Greek? It said, keep off the grass. <laughs> I felt a little bit uh, foolish then. I don't know. We got a call one day, Christy and I did. We were having a uh, an activity at the little lighthouse and they were collecting cookies for some kind of event not announced in the church if, uh, if you can bake some cookies let us know we'll come by and pick them up and take them to the little lighthouse and I got a phone call this lady said I've made some cookies can you come by and pick them up and I said who is this she said Mildred I said great we'll be Christy and I'll come by and I said Mildred called and said that uh, She'd made some cookies for the little lighthouse, so Christy and I promptly went over there. Well, guess what? There's two Mildreds in that church. And we went to the wrong one and knocked on the door, and she invited us in. We went in and sat there in her living room and had a very wonderful conversation. But then she wondered what in the world was going on when I finally said to her, Well, I guess we better get our cookies and go. And she said, Cookies? And I said, Yes. So we came over to pick up some cookies. And uh, all of a sudden, Chris and I began realizing, we're at the wrong Mildred's house. And she was such a gracious lady. She's saying, well, I don't have any cookies. If you'd come back tomorrow, maybe I can bake you some or something. And then we were trying to explain we'd come to the wrong house. Felt like a big fool. But all of us have times when we're foolish, and those are just misunderstandings. But when it comes to matters of the Spirit, when it comes to the relationship with God, we do not want to live as fools. And what the Bible describes as fools. In Proverbs, it talks about this way of wisdom, and this path of wisdom, and this wise person. And then it talks in various passages about another kind of person and what is the opposite of a wise person it is a foolish person but interestingly enough when you look at proverbs and you look at the hebrew language there are actually multiple types of fools maybe you didn't realize that there are four different words used in the hebrew language to describe one who is a fool, each one implying a little bit different type of negative character trait. And so, I've titled this sermon, What Kind of Fool Am I? <laughs> Maybe you can identify yourselves with one or more of these characters. First one, I've given titles to each of these, is the person I just call the simple. In the, in the Hebrew, it's the word pati. It means someone who's gullible. They're open to just everything but truth. Uh, they're kind of naive. In fact, in, in the Proverbs 4.15 it says, The knave believes everything. They can just be taken in by everything. People trick them, fool them. In, in 121 it says, How long, O simple ones, using this word petite, will you love being simple? These are people that are just very gullible. 
the, they're very fragile, they're very gullible, they, they can be taken in and they're like, likely to believe anything spiritually, morally, relationally. Just some scheme that people talk. I used to watch on TV this program called American Greed. Have you ever seen that? It's always about somebody who's cheating somebody, someone who's jipping somebody, and someone who falls for some line that somebody else is telling them and they're losing all their money, they're losing their property, and when the authorities finally get involved, they say something like, well, I, I thought it sounded too good to be true. And if it sounds too good to be true, it's too good to be true. It isn't true. The gullible, people who just kind of fall for everything. They're just kind of simple-minded people. Unfortunately, there are millions of people who live in a kind of naive spirit. And they're gullible not only for material schemes, they're, they're gullible for spiritual schemes. People trick them, lead them astray. They buy things, buy into things, and buy into ideas that do not bring them closer to God. And then there is the person... And I gave it the label, the loner. They just live life by themselves. In the Hebrew word, it's the word nabal. These are people who have no fellowship with one another. They really don't have any close friends. Uh, They really don't have a relationship with God. In Isaiah 32, verse 6, it says, A fool, using this word nabal, speaks nonsense and inclines his heart toward, toward wickedness to keep hungry and unsatisfied. Uh, The Nabal, you remember in uh, 1 Samuel 25, was the name of a person who was named after his character, Nabal. And you remember his relationship with David, and David tried to initiate terms of peace, but Nabal didn't trust him, and David sent some, uh, some emissaries to negotiate terms of peace, and he treated them disrespectfully and and really launched a war against David, acted very foolishly, he could have become one of David's friends, but ended up engaging himself in battle with David. And and his wife came to intervene on his half and says, please don't pay any attention to my husband, for as his name is, so is his heart. Nabal, it meant he was a fool and he acted as a fool and he lived without any real fellowship or companion or connections uh, throughout the community. We had a man in seminary who had a lot of trouble with this. He tried to isolate himself and go through seminary without a support group or a fellowship group. And finally, some of his friends kind of intervened and said, Steve, you need the fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're going to make it through seminary, you, you, need, you can't go through this in a lonely path. And it literally changed his life. And then there's a third kind of fool. I labeled him the knucklehead. In Hebrew, it's the kasil. He never admits wrong. He makes the same mistakes over and over again. Kind of a terrible image, Proverbs 26, 11, like a dog returning to his vomit as a fool in his folly says in Proverbs 17, a rebuke goes deeper uh, into one of understanding than a hundred blows into a fool. This is a person who repeats his mistakes over and over and over again. He just never seems to learn anything. Just keeps going on through life, making the same mistakes. These are the people that the court systems are all aware of. And they come into the court system and the judge looks at them and says, uh, Haven't I seen you here before? (laughs) Weren't you in my court just about a month ago for some kind of similar manner? We had a man like that in one of the communities I lived. He wasn't a dangerous man or a real threat. He was just kind of nuisance. But but any time you'd ask him, What are you doing here again? Why are you here again? Uh, Why are you repeating this? He'd say, Well so-and-so did this to me, or something happened. It was always something outside of himself. It was never something he did or a decision he made. He was always blaming somebody else. And this Casil never is able to admit that maybe they are contributing to their own misery or contributing to their own folly, contributing to their own actions. And We're foolish if we can't come to the point to see, hey, maybe in an argument or maybe in a dispute, 
Maybe I'm contributing in some way. Maybe there's some things about myself that I need to change. That's wisdom when we can begin to see things kind of objectively and reflectively and make some changes in our own life. But but this kind of fool, and again, I don't know how to term him. I just called him the knucklehead. He just never seems to learn. No matter what you do to him, say to him, no matter what experience is negative, never seems to learn from his mistakes. And so... Life tends to just kind of go in circles for them. They just go around and around, and and maybe it's financial matters. Maybe they come to a place where they're doing a little bit better, but then all of a sudden all their money's gone. They're they're in debt again. They're in all kinds of trouble again, and now now people are having to bail them out or help them in some way. They just never seem to get going in a right direction because they cannot seemingly learn from their mistakes and how their behaviors are contributing in a negative way. And then finally, there is, a, I call this person the insolent. It's, if you translate it from Hebrew into English, it's W-E-I-L, it's pronounced veal. And this is a person with a terrible temper. This is a person who is morally unstable. This is a fool with an attitude, okay? This is a fool with, with kind of a defiance about them. This is the person in Proverbs 14. Remember the verse that says, The fool says in his heart there is no God. That's the word that's being translated here, this veal. The fool, this kind of insolent, defiant fool, there is no God. And you know, the, the secret about it is it's not necessarily really that they objectively think there is or isn't a God. But they know that if they really admit and and come to a point of affirming that, they're going to have to change their lives. They're going to have to submit their lives. They're going to have to yield their lives to God. But it says in Proverbs 10.8, this babbling fool, this veal, this babbling fool will ultimately be thrown down. These are the kind of people who say to themselves, my mind's made up, don't confuse me with the facts. You ever known anybody like that? Ever known anybody that just uh, <coughs> doesn't really matter much what the issue is? They just kind of like to argue. Now, now you're knowing something about the veal. And the only, the sad thing is, though, um, it's not just with with other people. Their mind's made up about God. It's like it doesn't matter how much evidence you can give them of God or someone gives a wonderful testimony about what God's done in their life and and maybe the testimony is so powerful and so meaningful it's hard to it's hard to denounce or it's hard to deny but they don't want to accept it or take joy in it or or be moved by it or change their life to it or yield their life to it as my mind's made up don't confuse me with the facts don't give me a book by Josh McDowell on apologetics or Jesus is the Carpenter or any of those books which go into the case for Christianity by Lee Strobel. Don't give me any of those books. My mind's made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. And it's an inconvenient truth if I have to live with a God who is real and makes claims on my life. And so they are people who are fools with an attitude. They're not just simple-minded They're they're not just people that are relationally kind of incompetent and have trouble making friends or they're always saying the wrong thing and throwing throwing friends away. That would be kind of the loner. They're not not just the knucklehead that for some reason just doesn't have have the reflective insight to learn from their mistakes. No, these are the people who are kind of insolent. They are foolish with an attitude and that attitude brings them down. If others in their relationship with God. It, it's just kind of like a, an angry attitude of, uh, don't tell me about God because I don't want to give my life to Him and I'm not going to pay any attention to Him. The fool says in his heart, doesn't say it, notice that, doesn't say in his mind. He says in his heart, this is a matter of the heart that there is no God. But for each and every one of these, and and I will just have to say um, that for many people at at various times in our life, we can display one or more attributes of foolishness. 
There have been times when I have naively gotten involved in projects or proposals that I look back on and thought, how did I ever get involved in this? Why did I ever, why did I ever go along with this? this? This wasn't really a good idea. How did I get talked into this? There have been times when I've had experience and the consequences have come upon me. Uh, I remember uh, a couple of times in seminary when I procrastinated and got myself under the gun found myself late, late, up late, late, late at night studying or trying to finish a paper or something and sitting there thinking, you know, this is the exact same thing that happened last semester when I had a paper due that was unpleasant and I couldn't get started on. And now here I am again, here I am again, whole thing, whole thing over again. I, I vowed last time I'm going to start that project early. I'm going to get going on that paper early. I'm not going to put myself in this bind of studying for this test. Uh, here I am again. There, there have been times when I've been a knucklehead about things, and I know it's all Christy and Beth's fault. I mean, it's just, or my son's. It's just evident to me it's somebody else's fault and my fault. How could it be my fault? And I'm knuckleheaded about it. There are times when people shift into this more drastic, insolent kind of foolishness especially in times of grief. And they feel like somehow maybe God's kind of failed them or things didn't turn out the way they wanted. And there's kind of an anger that builds up within them. And they're just mad. And they, they think, I, I didn't think this was fair. I don't think this is totally fair. And, and, they, and so they kind of shift into this, this, this temper tantrum against God of, Okay, God didn't work things out the way I wanted them to work out, so I'm just kind of mad. And yet, in, in the long run, they're only kind of hurting themselves. So each and every one of these, we read these and we look at these and we look at the passages about them. And, and it's easy to say, I, yeah, I know somebody like that. You know, I've got an uncle so-and-so and he's that one. And, and I've got a friend uh, at work and he's, he's this one. He's that kind of fool. But the fact of the matter is, each and every one of us at different times or different situations in our life have probably slipped into at least aspects of, of a foolish life. But for each and every one of these, the answer is pretty much the same, and it's, it's acknowledging the folly of our heart and turning our life back towards God. It says in verse 7, and we're going to be exploring this more and more. This was kind of an, kind of started on a negative path of what kind of fools can we make of ourselves. But the goal is how do we live in wisdom? And that, that's going to be the focus of this series. But it begins with this in verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom instruction, but those who are wise live in awe. It's not a trembling fear, it's an awe, a, a sense of, of God's power and might and wonder over the world and, 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 and just being in awe of his love for us and awe of his control of our life. and living in this fear of, of God, knowing that our lives need to be seated, uh, submitted to Him. And that's how we begin to live this life of wisdom. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Good morning. Now it's time for joys and concerns. Um, the flowers this morning were are in honor of Pastor Schneider. This week's birthdays today is Marion Peacock's birthday and Lana Greenfield's birthday. Tomorrow is Michelle Carter's birthday. We have Janet Rogers and Susan Hoff. Um, Kenneth Helms and Mark Steiger are among some of the other birthdays that we'll be celebrating this week. Uh, one of the joys that we had this week, and I know Christy had her grandkids, Lori's got her grandkids. We had a couple of our grandkids this week, and we spent a lot of time in the pool. Friday, Eli and I went to get donuts, that's our tradition. And I saw my reflection in the mirror. I said, oh, my hair's a mess. If somebody didn't do cannonballs into the pool all the time, it wouldn't be this way. He goes, Gigi, your hair always looks that way. <laughs> <clears throat> so kids, they're a joy, but they tell the truth sometimes, too. Among other joys, Diane Gloden is home, gradually getting better. Liz Murphy is in rehab and doing well. John Arbenz passed, Phil Taylor, Harold Lewis. Not only are they husbands, daddies, parents, they're also our friends. I think all of us right now are just reeling from deaths. And not only do we have deaths, but we have kids who are making knucklehead decisions, air conditionings that are breaking, COVID, riots, upcoming election. And I think Pastor's closing statement was, if you're wise, you can still live in awe of God. I have some scriptures that I'd like to share with you. Will you join me in prayer, please? God, please help us to be still and know that you are God, that you will be exalted among the nations. Help us not to be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Help us to present our requests to you. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, Philippians 4. God, when we don't know what to do and we don't know how to comfort, we don't know what the heck is going on, help us to trust in you with all of our hearts and lean not on our own understanding. In all of our ways, help us acknowledge you and you will make our paths straight. Isaiah 41 tells us not to fear, for you are with us. We shouldn't be dismayed, for you are our God. You're going to strengthen us. You're going to help us. And you're going to uphold us with your mighty right hand. Oh, Lord, it says in Matthew 11:28, all of us should come to you who are weary and burdened, and you will give us rest. We've got so many burdens, God. We're so weary. Thank you for the rest that you do provide for us. Help us to take comfort in the fact that even to our old age and gray hairs, you are God. You will sustain us. You have made us and you will carry us. You will sustain us and you will rescue us. Help us to remember that you are our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. If we don't keep our eyes on you, God, it's easy to start worrying. Help us to remember Deuteronomy 31.6. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or terrified, for the Lord your God goes with you. You will never leave us, 
and you will never forsake us. Thank you for giving us strength and increasing the power of the weak. Help us to remember, God, your way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. All of these things that we read in your word are true. And that you are a shield for all of us who take refuge in you. Talking about wisdom, God. Psalm 32, 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. And when we have these trials that we think we're going to get washed under, help us to greatly rejoice through these. For a little while now, we may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, but they have come so that our faith which is of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may even be proved genuine and may result in the praise and the glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. And the very last verse of Psalm says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You can turn to uh, either page 13 or your hymnal. As we share together in the great thanksgiving, or I believe is it also going to be on the screen? It will be on the screen as we share together. And again, uh, after we share in the liturgy and the elements are blessed, and this is true for you at home as well, you'll just take your elements and we'll have some music uh, that'll set a a meditative stage reflectively. When you're ready, uh, open your elements or take your elements and share together uh, in this wonderful meal together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism and suffering of his death and resurrection you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery, descended death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. 
O Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in his final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, all Father, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Please receive them as you feel led. shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.
Amen. Thank you so much. Once again, Vicki, thank you for, for being with us today, and she'll be sharing uh, in our postlude. As soon as we know uh, the details and the arrangements or the memorial for John R. Benz, we will let the congregation know. Hope all of you have a safe and enjoyable Labor Day. Be blessed and be safe, and go forth in peace. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.